do a lot of research. If you know what you're talking about, this is one of the favorite, one of my favorite classes of the year. Um, I feel like um, this is very appropriate given our place in the arc of humanity and your age. Because in your age, transportation and driving and mobility have taken on an especially high significance. I don't know how many of you either just got a car or just thinking about a car or just fiending for a car. Or whether you're saving up or you're borrowing or you're screaming at mom for the wrong color on the Beamer. Either way, I think this is like that time when a, a lot of people really pay a lot of attention uh, to transportation. So I think that cars are a big deal for you. Also, this particular decade that we're about to start, transportation energy is a really big deal. There will be more changes in transportation infrastructure in the next 10 years than in the last 100 and some. Everybody lives in interesting times, but you live in really interesting times for uh, energy and transportation. And so uh, this will hopefully be a memorable class for you. My hope is to discuss all of the eight groups of alternatives and then see if we can find a way to cobble together a realistic vision for the future. Who wants to sell me a car technology? Raise your hand. Don't know it once, please. Move it along. Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, we did uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Okay. And the good things about hydrogen fuel cells are quickly listed. Uh, they're super low uh, on carbon emissions. They are uh, affordable once we realize that we have to mass produce them. Um, they are less combustible than gasoline. And uh, yeah. And then the downsides? Um, they can't start in freezing weather. Um, but it never freezes. Yeah. And then um, uh, the basic technology can become a hydrogen bomb. Like the, the no, big the um, no big deal. No big deal. And the amount of energy in hydrogen is about one third the amount of gasoline. So they're trying to crystallize the hydrogen to be able to fit more. Yeah. Uh, by the way, common misconception about that hydrogen bomb thing. Uh, the hydrogen bomb is a very special use of hydrogen. So when people say hydrogen bomb, it's not just an explosion of hydrogen. Hydrogen is explosive, but it does not make your car into a bomb. You know, you know uh, Hiroshima hydrogen bomb. <laughs> <laughs> a little different. Just every time I've gotten a <laughs> right, a little different. It is a bomb of hydrogen, yes, yeah. yes, but it's not a hydrogen bomb. <clears throat> well, it depends actually. You'd have to severely total a spark right next to a severely total hydrogen tank. The car could be just fine if you could just blow up the tank. But that would be a big boom. Now, anybody else in the audience know anything that was left out of that, good or bad? Hydrogen fuel cell, that was? I think they're like really expensive. Yeah, yeah and not very durable. Uh, both of these are true. They're, they're not very durable because the hydrogen fuel cell is a really fancy sort of battery that has plumbing attached to a battery. But remember that the car is an electric car. It's just an electric car. Instead of having one type of battery, it has a tank of hydrogen that feeds hydrogen as the electricity source, and the, uh, the fuel cell is the electricity source. So instead of feeding your car gasoline for a internal combustion engine, you feed it pressurized liquid hydrogen as a uh, fuel source to the battery. The reason they last very long is hydrogen fuel cells are kind of new, they won't last forever. And the price is really high, but <coughs> Compared to an electric car, it's almost the same. 
it's the economy of scale right now that's that's making it as high as it is because there aren't the efficiencies of mass production yet. And that's why I think uh, Jake was very judicious in saying that the price will come down when mass produced. What else was left out of this conversation? Keep going, please. Um, when the when the company produces, um, it uses a non-renewable natural gas, which creates a massive amount of CO2 emissions. And by the way, you mean the hydrogen of the cars? I guess. Yeah. yeah. And what else about making the hydrogen? Anybody know the one? Nobody's hit the one crux of the question. <laughs> Yeah, basically you said it at the end. You spend this much energy to make the hydrogen that replaces that much gasoline. I'd rather just use this gasoline than that much fossil fuel energy somewhere else. <coughs> that makes sense to everybody? But here's the funny thing about hydrogen. We're talking about it today. You know, today, it's kind of hard to have a manned mission to Mars, but if we could just get a couple of technical hurdles out of the way, it would be a lot more doable. Also, hydrogen fuel cells. <coughs> There's another little secret about alternative energy, which is the baby Jesus will blow the wind and make the sun whenever he, I think, feels like it. See, the problem with alternative energy is when it's really hot and everybody wants the air conditioning, there might not be enough wind. Or at night, when everybody wants to turn on the light bulbs, there might not be enough solar. Because, you know, it's night. The problem with alternative energy today is that alternative energy is whenever the baby Jesus feels like it. And our energy demand has these discrete spikes and crashes. Like at 5 a.m., energy flow spikes across America until about 9, then it kind of middles. Then from 5 until 10 p.m. it spikes again, and then overnight, starting at midnight, it gets really, really low. You can turn on the nuclear, natural gas, coal, and petroleum, whatever you want. But you can't tell the baby Jesus, we need wind right now, go, start the wind. So the funny thing about alternative energy is you're always going to need the conventional energy, because the conventional energy is whenever the people want to use it. The alternative energy is whenever the baby Jesus feels like it. Unless there was a way to store the goodwill of the baby Jesus until humanity actually needs that electricity. Does that make sense to everybody? And hydrogen might be that way. If we could turn wind and solar facilities into the hydrogen producers, we could use free energy supply, wind and sunlight. When it's extra, leftover, not used as energy, electricity for the grid, to build the hydrogen that stores in a tank forever, like propane in a propane tank. As long as it doesn't leak, it lasts forever. So imagine hydrogen fuel cell cars made from, you know, the leftover baby Jesus generosity. Conceptually, any way that you can keep waste useful, you've made a gain. This is why I pick up everything and reuse everything, because the stupidest thing on earth is the one-way street of garbage. Any way you can keep your waste useful, you're a smart person. So when there's wasted leftover alternative energy that we can turn into hydrogen that becomes useful later for driving cars, this is when I see hydrogen fuel cells being a viable alternative. When we have surplus, surplus, <laughs> surplus, surplus alternative energy supplies. You like? Yeah. Next, pull this up other car. So I'd say come back later. Go. So we did the vegetables. Yes. And um, it's the best because it's efficient. It gets great uh, miles per gallon. We don't need regular tuna-ups. It's very affordable. It's you need less regular tuna -ups. Less regular tuna -ups, yeah. Um, right, it's pretty affordable. It's $1.50 a gallon. Um, it's available everywhere. And so in, in the U.S., if we're kind of basing it off that, so it reduces more dependency. Uh, get them all over, and it's incredibly eco-friendly because the fuel is basically right now going to waste. There were 11 billion liters going to waste.
that sounds very good. And I, I remind you, you didn't quite say it, but most of those CO2 emissions are not ancient CO2 that's adding CO2 to the atmosphere to cause global warming. It's current CO2 that lived in the plant for a while that's going back to the atmosphere, which does not add global warming. Remember that distinction between the biotic carbon and the lithospheric carbon coming back into the biosphere that's extra. Remember that? So what's the problem with vegetable oil? That sounds too good to be true. That grow a lot of vegetables. How many vegetables? Anybody know? Whoa. Maybe 13. Yeah. Anybody know how much of our diesel engines we could run with all the vegetable oil in the market? 18%. You see, remember I was telling you, the greatest wisdom is making use of another man's garbage. And waste vegetable oil is a byproduct of our food economy. It's truly trash. So turning that trash into something useful, nice. But I just ain't that much. We don't have the agricultural capacity to grow all the vegetable oil we would need for all of our diesel engines. We just don't. And it used to be that you could get vegetable oil as garbage all over the place, but technically today, every restaurant in the world, at least in the most of the modern world, is selling their used vegetable oil to people who make biodiesel commercially. It's become a commodity, no longer a waste product, which is good. Commodifying waste is good. But I mean to say, it's not economically free. It's a great market, but it's a small percentage of our. So I would say to your vegetable oil sellers, you know, that sounds really good, but that's only going to be a small wedge of my transportation. I want to need to go back for something else. And I should point out that there are other ways to make vegetable oil. If we ever need it, more diesel than we can get from waste vegetable oil? Anybody know how to do that? Anybody know what the world's leading carbon capture is? Jack Keogh knows. Planking. Close. Seaweed. Yeah. Kelp. Uh, we can turn algae of various sorts into a different type of oil that can still become biodiesel. So whatever source of biodiesel we're talking about, we won't need petroleum diesel for very much longer. It might be the cheapest way to get diesel, but there will be plenty sustainable ways with all of our waste vegetable oil and if we need it, algae on top of that. Yeah, Vegetable oil is reacted to make biodiesel. Biodiesel is diesel from bio. So the distinction is petrodiesel versus biodiesel. And algae and or vegetable oil can be transformed into the biodiesel. Biodiesel comes from vegetable oil or algae oil. Make sense? Who else wants to sell me transportation systems? Yes, Nick? Hybrid technology. I like hybrid, tell me. Um, so we are 25 to 90% less carbon based emissions than hybrid cars. In which part? In the car, the car, the car, the car, and I think it makes, you know, driving, it's not making it. In driving, that's the downside. That is the downside, yes. We'll come back to the downside. Go on with the good sides, um, upsides. Okay. Average. Um, better mileage for this. It can last longer in some cases. If you're not that into right, as long as you don't use it, it lasts forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
And four in metal. Very well, very well summarized. Anybody have something to add to this uh, hybrid car thing? Yes? Well, oh, if making electric or hybrid cars would create more jobs, wouldn't there be a bigger, like, more people wouldn't have jobs because gas cars would not be perfect? Yeah, and I always find these questions of jobs to be sort of interesting because every time I hear about making more jobs, it's like, great, I get to take more of my working money and give it to Jake, so now he has a job. Where'd all my money go? Like, these, these economies that generate jobs, you have to wonder, if it's not a new economy that's either money coming from somewhere or jobs coming from another economic sector. I'm not skeptical that we can make more jobs. I just mean to say I'm always a little bit nervous when I hear that. Because if that's my dollars making your job, I'd rather you get your own money. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 where, where the job comes from to me is always a very tricky question. You know, it, it's really easy to generate jobs just by, you know, giving away money or by taking away jobs. I wonder if there's a way to actually build economies here. I kind of doubt that there are more. Can you it? Well, I was going to say, isn't that kind of irrelevant because of the whole infrastructure thing isn't part of this, but it, I don't think that's what. Okay, great. Can I talk to you? Who else? Yes. Um, wasn't the entire project supposed to be on like a blank country? On a what? Blank slate country, yes. Yes. But when people say it's going to make jobs, my argument is will it make more jobs than the gasoline alternative that we oh, currently yeah. know the scale of? Or less, and if it is going to make more than gasoline, how are we making more of that gasoline? Okay, here's where I am on hybrids. They do turn waste into energy. In case you don't know it, people drive very wastefully. Watch me; I'll show you how I drive. I go, and I speed up, and then I go at the stop sign. Is that how you drive? Then I go, and then I go, and I stop at the stop sign. Now, if you haven't, is that how he drives? Is that a different conversation? I'm going to throw my pencil into your eyeball. Okay. I don't know if this is how you drive, but you got to realize when you hit the brakes, that's because you shouldn't have hit the gas. So what happens is, all that extra gas had to be canceled out by the brake. The whole point is, your car didn't come to a stop because you would have shot past the stop because you had too much gas. So instead, you use the brake. And I know that's how we all drive, and it's unavoidable, and everybody's going to do it. You got, I know that there's hills and stuff. But 20 to 30% of America's gasoline consumption is wasted gasoline that needs to be canceled out by braking. That's how hybrids are more efficient. They capture that, and they turn it into electricity for pushing the car later along. That's the whole magic right there. So I got two things to tell you about hybrid. One, every possible vehicle that can be hybrid should be hybrid. By the way, you cannot use electric motors for very high torque, low RPM, heavyweight vehicles. So you can't make everything hybrid, but almost everything can be hybrid and it should be. Because you capture wasted energy. Instead of braking with discs, you brake with a generator that slows you down by turning the thing that makes the electricity. Does that make sense to everybody? Everything should have hybrids. You should have. But, but not yet. But not yet. Not everything should have hybrids yet. Because right now, if you go cradle to grave on the hybrid system, it's really, really, really environmentally costly. And any carbon savings you might carve out, depending on how many miles you can get out of your hybrid system, 
are probably canceled out by the pollution and social impacts of the hybrid drivetrains we use today. Fun fact indeed. Another fun fact, the governor owned 13 Hummers at one point. He's no joke. And he drove them all at once. He, he was a paid sponsor for Hummer. He, he worked for Hummer before he became the governor. Hey, I mean, he worked for GM. Okay. Me again. Me again. The hybrid technology should be everywhere as soon as we get the clean hybrid technology of the future. But let me remind you, it lets you erase part of the impact of your bad driving habits, you could also just lay off the pedals a little bit. You know, that's just wasted money. Because you're never going to get that money back. You just caused global warming for no reason, and you just took a dime and you threw it out the window every time you slammed the brakes at the stop sign. And I know it's just a dime, but that's a lot of stop signs, it's a lot of dimes. Who else with this on me a car? Yes? Uh, so for electricity, it's a light rain of the body, so it's, it can go a lot faster. Uh, there's a lithium ion battery, which is totally recyclable. Um, it's no like oil changes or anything like that, so it's more reliable. Because uh, it's not using, um, it's not having a transmission or combustion energy. They're not motor, yeah, they're not motor, but you still need yeah. to grease, you still need to grease the bearings and stuff. There are duplicates required because it's still a try to lower drag. But yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, um, Renault did a cradle to grave analysis. A lot of Renault? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Some kind of former European. You turned out to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they uh, they did that and they found that um, so they made an electric sedan and compared it to a diesel and gas um, car of the same model and found that it uses less carbon to make the car and less carbon to use to actually drive it. Um, and then yeah, a lot of people say that um, to like to use electricity, you need to use carbon, um, but you can use like other methods, methods such as like hydraulic, solar, and turbine. Yes, you can. Anybody else have something they want to say? Downsides? Um, downsides of lithium ion battery Anybody else? Yes? Yeah, my dad's Nissan Leaf needs to sit in the in the garage, I think, for five hours so he can drive two hours. Who else? No, I had a question. For the Tesla's isn't it kind of catching on fire? There's been like a few incidents of them like going over the bumps. You know, all sorts of cars catch on fire. So yeah, and there's a lot of wires, and wires will cross, and rats like to take the insulation off wires, and yeah. But cars catch on fire. And so I don't know if Teslas are necessarily an explosive vehicle by per se. Yeah. and make electricity from something else, but well, we're not. You see, look, there's a reason that I left my fugly drawings up on the board here. There's a reason I left my fugly drawings on the board. Three units of energy used to make one unit of electricity in your house that you'll use to charge your car with a limited efficiency. But then you'll also have some of the inherent inefficiencies of pushing a big heavy thing in space. This is one of those things where I'm like, yeah, that would be great in the future. And I truly believe that electric cars are the future. But I think they're the most distant part of this planet. I think they're the end point. They're like, that's when we come out of the barrel. When we have plentiful alternative electricity, 
that's the lowest environmental impact and the lowest dollar cost for energy that we've ever had. Now we're talking. That's when we can run the cars on electricity. And I'll give you the daydream for electricity. Instead of having to recharge at home for 55 million hours and having all these different kind of batteries that you got to update and they explode and they light on fire and they're nasty for the environment, imagine state-run, I'm sorry about the socialist thing, but give me a point, imagine state-run refueling stations where you pull up and the robot pulls out your standardized battery and plugs in the brand new charge battery and then you drive away a 30 second refuel. All batteries are standardized, it's an act of Congress. This year we will use this battery. Then they recharge, they maintain, they dispose in large scale, and you don't need all those wires and inefficiencies of charging it at your house because coincidentally they can either ship them off to be charged at the power plant hopefully an alternative energy sustainable free power plant. Or you just put the recharging station at the big transformers where you have the least waste. He's a good plan, right? Yeah. Stay for president. You should run for president, too. I, I, I think so, too. Yes? Could you do it instead of like government with like your own businesses? Like, would there be like corporations that could do that? Yeah, sure. And you know, it doesn't, as long as it's state managed for the standardization, you job out as much of it as possible. My point is, the tricky part of the electric infrastructure is 50 zillion different types of batteries and 50 zillion different types of chargers and 50 zillion different inefficiencies in the system. I think we get the glorious saving from the socialist dream of one little thing being done by government. Because that's really one of the times that I can imagine environmental solutions coming from something where the government can do it better than everybody trying to get the same benefit in the dispersed model. I'm not saying that it has to be like a government worker that's pulling out the battery, but I think it would require some standardization. You know, like, how nice would it be if all of these things had standardized batteries? Of course they don't. Everybody wants to sell you their battery. So we've given over all the environmental benefits of standardization to create private sector profit. And if we do that with electric cars, that's what's going to happen. The communist in me really loved the head. There's just this one little part of the daydream that would really benefit from a little heavy-handed government, I think, and that's the standardization of the batteries. And by the way, they're not forever. Batteries don't last very long. So it's not like you're committing to doing that one battery forever. There's still a reason to innovate. You might be able to sell government the next battery. Now, whatever. You can have seven different types for seven cars or whatever. I get that. As long as it's something that can reasonably be standardized. Who else wants to sell me a car? Yeah. To compress natural gas vehicles, uh, burn cleaner than gas and diesel. They're efficient, safe. Uh, Thomas has one. Thomas has one. Existing gas and diesel cars can be converted, and U.S. natural gas reserves are abundant. That's all very true. And dollar for dollar, it's the cheapest mile per penny, or penny per mile. Uh, you can get like a hundred miles for like two dollars, I think, right now. Which blows doors on whatever else you wanted to use. You can fuel them at home. We already have them. There's one parked across the street from my house for right now. But uh, what's the problem with natural gas? Yeah. Well, you have natural gas in your house, so you're running all your natural yeah. gas. And you compress, you got to buy a compressor, it's like four grand. So it takes about two years to pay it so long. It's still fossil fuel, and it's the cleanest emitting of the fossil fuels, but it's not necessarily the cleanest option for the mining and the extraction, and it's still fossil fuels, it's still ancient carbon. Now, here's a little secret that a lot of you don't know, though. Methane is a waste product of decomposition. Can we use scrap as and wastewater What he just said. We already have to deal with the methane from the landfill and the wastewater treatment facility. We could run a few cars on that. Maybe not all the cars, 
but it is a way to intercept the waste methane and make it into transportation energy. If you let the methane go into the air, it's 10 times hotter as a greenhouse gas than when you burn it and turn it into CO2 going into the air. So waste methane, we can cut down the global warming impact by 90% and turn waste into transportation fuel. So we don't have enough waste methane to run the whole system, but that's another little wedge that I can use with garbage instead of using fossil fuel. I like that. If somebody else wanted to sell me a car, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. So here comes my plan. Ha ha. Ha ha. I don't want to hear your stupid story anyway. No, actually, we got, we got a couple minutes. Yeah, go ahead, tell me your story. What do you want to sell me? Um, cellulose ethanol. Ooh, what kind of ethanol? Cellulose. Wait, I thought that stuff was made from corn. Yeah, it could be the most special sweet grass corn. Is that right? Tell me more. So, the corn benefits the agricultural um, divisions of our government. <laughs> you mean our country? Here, but, uh, then we stop relying on foreign oil, and then um, we would have reduced um, one billion tons of available biomass through corn and sweet grass and such, and that converts to about 80 to 100 million gallons of ethanol every year. Um, ethanol has zero carbon dioxide emissions, and growing the fuel actually um, takes in, absorbs. CO2 and uh, the waste that it produces. Oh, there it goes back to the atmosphere when you burn it. I thought it was. So, waste that it produces can be used in um, cattle feed, which, is a high, which can be used as a high protein diet. Um, it's really safe, and um, we would stop foreign dependency, and the government can start making a lot of money. I'm glad you mentioned this, and I'm going to have to fold that into my spiel at the end. So watch this. Here comes my plan. There is hope. Was it for president? Hmm. We have conventional gasoline now, and we have all those cars, so we should use them up. I hate it when people say, I've only used half the pencil, but I'm going to throw it away because I found a cooler pencil. That's stupid. <laughs> this is garbage otherwise, so let's use it up. All of our gasoline cars, we should run them down to a bloody stump, and that's almost 100 years of transportation future. We should use up our gasoline cars. But we could use ethanol to extend the existing supply of gasoline and to lower the pollution cost of gasoline because ethanol is a thinner, an additive to gasoline. So instead of going full gasoline, we just add a little bit of ethanol, meaning there's less gasoline being used and less air pollution being produced. Make sense? Yeah. Ethanol is an agricultural product. I'm not interested, bro. Too much water problem, <laughs> too much carbon input, too much soil loss, not enough food to go around for the people and the animals. Sorry about the Corn Belt subsidies, but I'm not interested in agricultural biofuels. That said, he said cellulose there are agricultural wastes, including grass you can just mow that you can turn into ethanol. And that I will buy. Because that's current carbon that stays current carbon. And that's an otherwise waste product that we can intercept and turn into energy. I like that system. You'll notice we can drive a lot of cars on waste. Now diesel is the most efficient fossil fuel. And BT dubs if you need to go buy a car today, dollars for mileage, for maintenance, for lifetime, the most efficient cradle to grave option that you can drive off the lot this Wednesday right now, turbo injected small diesel, probably Volkswagen, GTI or something. Yeah, yeah something like that. <clears throat> if you can go down to Mexico, you can buy my Tacoma as the Hilux. Exact same thing as my truck, except it's diesel, so it gets, you know, almost double the mileage. What is that, 40? Almost. Diesel, across the board, is a 33% improvement in gasoline mileage, everything else being equal. So what does it get 33% better. Isn't it a little bit more expensive per gallon of diesel? Per gallon, but less per mile. 
because you get a lot more miles out of the gallon. So it's a little bit more for the price, but a lot more mileage for the price. Yeah? You're recommending that we buy this bus now, but it's not the future. Right, so I'm saying that living in the present, all cars in the future should be diesel until we can make the next move. Here comes the next move. Hybrid everything. Except for high torque, low rev engines, we should hybrid everything. It's just turning all that waste energy of your bad habits, or necessary mandatory braking like on hills, into something that is useful. You turn gravity into energy. Hybrid everything, but we need cleaner hybrid. We're not ready right now. The current hybrids, massive environmental and social impacts. Sorry to tell you that. Hydrogen fuel cells are a great way to store and transfer alternative energy, especially extra slash overflow alternative energy. So hydrogen fuel cells, definitely a good option when we have more sustainable electricity. Uh, compressed natural gas is the best of the fossil fuels, but we don't really have the infrastructure, and do we really want to get into this whole natural gas thing for the long run? It's still fossil fuel. So rather than do more installation of natural gas, I would say we should limit that to specific sectors of the transportation economy so that we can use up our waste methane in something useful instead of causing global warming with it. Vegetable oil is a great way to use waste, but again, it's a small wedge of our transportation economy, like the vehicles that need to be diesel. Those um, high torque, low RPM vehicles, like tractors and trailers and stuff, those have to be diesel. We should run them with waste vegetable oil. If we need more, we can grow it with algae. And electric is the future. Once we have clean production, better batteries, and I keep saying it, some sort of a battery exchange station instead of everybody charging them at home with all those inefficiencies in the wires. Mad trains, I mean like trans mass transportation becomes totally affordable all of a sudden. It's a no brainer, once we have alternative electricity, it will be the way to do transportation. But in the meantime, there's something you can all do right now without buying a new car, without voting for Jose for president. Your car needs to lose weight. Think about it. The reason you're spending energy is because you're pushing something around. And you all realize it's harder to push something that's heavier. Anything that you're carrying around in your car that you don't need, you're just paying money to take it for a ride. It's like, hey, golf clubs, let's go for a ride. And you're paying for that weight. You're shipping it. Every day you're driving it around, it's like giving UPS money. Just here, can you just fly my golf clubs over to Hayden's house and then fly them back? Thank you. It's just like an unnecessary UPS package. <laughs> if it's in your car, it doesn't have to be. Just get it out of there. You're just wasting money. It's just stupid. All that unnecessary global warming because you're too lazy to take it out of your car. And you're paying for that too. Second of all, that thing about speeding up and then hitting the brakes and then speeding up and then hitting the brakes, it don't make no sense. Orange County has all these avenues that have a, a three-lane traffic with 65 mile an hour speed limit and stoplights every one mile. So right when you hit 65, you got to get right back down to zero. Totally stupid. That will think about it's just wasting energy. And every time it's like a dime, but think about it. When you go to the gas station, you turn your money at the register into a bucket of dimes. You put it on the passenger seat, and every time you slow down, you just throw one of them out the window. I know it's the dimes, but that's a whole bucket of dimes you just bought. Like, it doesn't feel like a big, oh, you know, it's just a dime. It's just a dime. But that's a whole bucket of dimes.